Buenas noches. Bienvenidas y bienvenidos. Welcome. My name is Omar Dawajere and I'm the Assistant Director at the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at NYU. On behalf of our director, Jill Lane, our faculty and students, we want to welcome you and our distinguished guests, Nano Stern and Tom Cruz, who will be moderating the conversation into our virtual space in what promises to be an insightful look into Chile's uprisings in conversation, decima, and song. Our mission as a Title VI uh, National Resource Center and academic program of promoting and understanding of our Latin American and Caribbean region continues in times of COVID-19, albeit with physical distancing, uh, the same way as political and social processes do in our hemisphere. For that reason, we continue bringing a spotlight on events in Chile. Following up uh, on last December's panel that brought political and social actors of, of the protests in conversation. We're thankful to count with the support of the North American Congress on Latin America and the Hemispheric, Hemispheric Institute with whom we collaborated on last year's talk. Uh, now please welcome Marcial Godoy, who's the Managing Director of the Hemispheric Institute, who will share with us more on Chile and formally introduce uh, Nano. Gracias por estar aquí y seguimos. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, Omar, uh, and all the panelists. Thank you so much for the invitation to continue uh, our collaboration with Clax around uh, issues uh, in Chile and particularly since the uprising. Um, in the last few days, um, I'm not sure if kind of people have been following the news, but uh, following the, the lockdown for the pandemic, uh, the protests, uh, the, the Chilean uprising basically sort of dissolved, space was locked down, uh, there's no one in the public square. And as of Monday, uh, protests have renewed uh, and repression continues, uh, particularly in the neighborhoods and now in resp uh, they are having to do uh, with the issue of hunger in particular, uh, but as communities are quarantined and the government fails to provide kind of adequate sources for families to survive, um, hunger has returned in the way that it had. We haven't seen it in Chile since the early 80s. If we remember that hunger was, and, and marches and protests against hunger were what precipitated the outbreak of the cycle of protests against the dictatorship in 1982 and 1983. So we have a return of the figure of the Olla Comun, which was sort of the, 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 the very strong sort of symbol and mode of organization in poor neighborhoods during that time. So uh, all of this is continuing and continuing to, to evolve under uh, certainly different conditions and perhaps more brutal conditions with the virus, uh, with quarantine, and with a battery of laws that have been passed in the past few months that criminalize social protest. So that is the update, that's where we are. And I think that that uh, makes it particularly kind of important uh, to be having this conversation and to have the Uh, with us and conversation. Um, I would like to introduce Nano um, and Tom. Um, Nano Stern's path as an artist uh, follows richly crafted song lines laid by his family and his Chilean musical ancestry uh, that unites those with a sound utterly fresh and relevant. Uh, the confluence of recent uh, student environmental and political events in his home country in Chile, uh, and Nano sort of rise as a writer and a performer, uh, have positioned him as a, a, a very important voice in a newly, uh, among a newly politicized uh, Chilean generation. Uh, political, outspoken, uh, Chilean singer, songwriter, and, uh, and activist Nano Stern has created his own musical language, uh, another worldly sound that blends the youthful exuberance of folk music mixed with years of classical and jazz training against the powerful force of traditional Chilean revolutionary song. Uh, what has emerged is a brilliantly layered confluence of indigenous African European uh, hemispheric musical influences that reverberate with a soulfulness and originality truly unlike any other um, uh, in uh, South American uh, uh, music today. So we are very pleased uh, to have Nano with us today. 
Uh, he has been praised by, by John Baez as the, quote, best young Chilean singer of his generation, uh, which is, uh, it, 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 I would be the, something to be proud of. Uh, Stern's skilled across a range of instruments and languages and uh, unites his talents to create a sound utterly fresh and relevant. Um, I have to say that I am and have been a big fan of Nano, and it's, a, it's an honor for me to be introducing him today. But I have to say, in particular, uh, Nano's inter, uh, intervention uh, in Twitter and in social media uh, using decimas, uh, the, the, the traditional uh, poetic form of the decima, uh, to, on a daily basis, comment and give updates on events surrounding the Chilean uprising, I have to say has been one of the most extraordinary uh, kind of contribution, sort of from music, from the arts, from poetry, I think into the social media space around the Chilean uprising, to have your news brought to you on a daily basis in the form of a decima uh, is truly something that's extraordinary and I continue to appreciate. So may, they can, may the decimas please continue to come along with the music. Uh, I would also like to introduce Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is the program director, a program director at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and an adjunct professor at the New School University. Uh, what will ensue here uh, will be a conversation, a dialogue between Tom and Nano, and uh, that will be, that it will include music, that will include uh, hopefully some decimas and uh, participation and questions from the audience a little further on in the program. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, please, uh, Nano and Tom, um, the stage is yours, so to speak. Thank you. Hola, thank hola. you. Hola, hola. Thank you, Marcial. Uh, well, this was supposed to be an in-person visit to New York City in April, Nano, but for obvious reasons, that didn't happen. And here we are struggling with um, doing these things and building these human connections over digital platforms. And there's nothing like the warmth of a room, but I would like to ask everyone who's out there, and I think we're up to, well, over 70 people now. Let's give Nano a warm applause, welcome. What I'd like you to do in your chat window, in the Zoom chat window, put your name, first name, put where you are, if it's New York City, and let's give us two words of how you're feeling today so that we can take the temperature of the room. One word is never enough, so think of two, like worried but excited to be here. So go ahead and start putting those, your names, where you're from, and a couple of words for us so we can start to feel the room. So. Thank you very, very much, Nano, for being here. Um, oh, and here we come, Camila and Rio de Janeiro, Marlene from New York, uh, Marcelo, Brazilian living in Chile, Edith in DC, Mayra, Cuban in New York. So we've got a lot of people, a lot of diversity in the house tonight. Um, so, uh, Marcel gave us a wonderful introduction about the relevance and the importance of tonight. And I'm hoping you can walk us through um, where we are, taking a look backward, taking a look forward, both through your direct experience and your song and your poetry. Um, what well, happened? Um, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, first I would also like to uh, say thank you to Marcel for the warm welcome. It's uh, good to know that this decimas that sometimes, you know, through this flat uh, sort of black mirror surface, you know, gets out into the world and people actually receive it. It's, it's a very heartwarming feeling, especially in these days, no? Uh, and thank you, Tom, and thank everyone for, for making this uh, possibility. It was such a bummer when I first heard that the tour wasn't going on. It was actually my first confrontation with the reality of COVID, you know, uh, when, when people started calling saying, hey, maybe these shows are not going to go through. And I, I, I was kind of, well, this was late February. It was kind of uh, surreal, no? But here we are in this uh, new reality in this completely deranged world. But uh, anyway, very nice to be able to, to talk to, to all of you, to you, Tom, to you, Marcial, and to everyone in the, in the chat. I'm going to be checking in a while. And uh, well, where are we now? You know, it's, it's, as Marcial was saying, it is a very crucial time these days, what's going on right now, because we are witnessing what seems to be the, 
the coming together of the of the health crisis with coronavirus and the collapse of hospitals and the raising of contagious uh, people daily and of deaths uh, up to the couple of thousands now of new cases every day and that's uh, eventually it was going to clash with the with the tremendous revolt that uh, that has been happening in Chile since uh, middle of October and it seems to be that two days ago this started happening no this clash of crises that we were all weary and that we were all expecting and that no one really knew how it was going to come through. It has started to come through and as Marcial was saying, it has come through in the most uh, saddening and, uh, and uh, concerning of ways, which is people that just are not able to bring food to their table and to feed their families. And it's the raw reality of an extremely unequal society uh, that has not been able over the last political cycle, one or two political cycles, depend how you look at it, no? uh, to, to come to terms with this inequality. You know? And uh, so my feeling, you were asking, how do we feel today? Um, I feel particularly bad, really, these days. No? I must be honest, it's a very gloomy situation. Also here in South America, uh, unlike you guys that, who are lucky to be heading into the summer, uh, winter is coming. And uh, today, it's the coldest day so far. It is raining here in Santiago. So to put it all together uh, and to imagine these neighborhoods. I live more or less in downtown, but if you go uh, into the outer neighborhoods, there's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's people who, as I said before, are already not being able to bring food to their table. Plus it's cold, plus the hospitals are collapsed. Uh, videos are starting to circulate where you see people uh, drowning in the waiting rooms and waiting there for three, four days, you know, connected to oxygen, just laying on the floor. So it's in a way the perfect storm heading our way. And, and that's why to be in all honesty, it's not a, it's not a good time at all. Plus we, we were coming from this supercharged uh, social movement. You, Tom, you, you were here in Chile in November, December, you know, so you could experience firsthand uh, not only what was going on, but how it was happening. You know, it was such an epic feeling. It was such a, 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 a wonderful, in a way, opportunity for all of us to finally say, wait a minute, this is not right. This has to change. And is this going to change? And we are going to change it. And all of a sudden, this perfect um, excuse comes for, for, for the government to impose very harsh uh, measures of social confinement and of social control and also of military control. No, Because un unlike in many other countries, in Chile, we have a curfew. And we've had it already for two months, and I would guess we're going to have it for a long time. And, uh, and it really makes no sense. I mean, it's a curfew that is only at night that applies to the whole country, I including regions where there is no cases of the virus at all. And there's military on the street, and pretty much the military are occupying the territory. No? So now that eventually after, after two months of suppressing and trying to, to silence this, this uh, social reality uh, through the virus and, this, and the health emergency, finally it's starting to, to come up. But big difference to a couple of months ago, the military are all over the country. The police have spent millions of dollars buying new uh, machines and new tear gas uh, trucks and, you know, I don't know what you call them in, in English, but repression is, uh, is, uh, is at at hand everywhere no thank you nano um that's a somber perspective a real um i'd like to go back to october if and i'm th one thought is to share a couple of images and i'm going to throw these up on the screen they're taken by pablo ernesto piuano an argentine photographer who was in santiago at that time and everyone should be able to see these and as I roll through these, maybe you could just talk us through a little bit what those days of protest and uprising were like in mm -hmm. October, November mm -hmm. in Santiago. Yeah, this, this is a very iconic image. I don't know if this is the very photo, but it, it's been going around. And uh, this is the center of town. It's uh, what was formerly called uh, Plaza Italia, Plaza Baquedano. It's this confusing habit in Chile of having different names for the same place, but has been since renamed Plaza La Ignidad. And it's the epicenter of protest in Chile has been for as long as I can remember. And uh, it was really where, uh, where people from all the city gathered. It is the neural neuralgic point. It is the heart of, of the transport system. And it is where many neighborhoods meet. And it is where the protests were most, uh, most intense, as you will see by the next pictures. This, is, this was the order of the day until March. No? I was uh, playing there at the last big protest, uh, which was on March 6th. 
uh, two days before Women's uh, Day, which was, of course, two million people historic march. And this was the scene every day, no? uh, downtown Santiago. Uh, you can see the graffiti here in the back. Paco Asesino. Paco is the, the police, the, the, the way that we call the policeman. No? It's a colloquial way of saying a murder police. Uh, and you can see by the, by the photo that it's no exaggeration. No? These uh, are the people who were firing at civilians uh, with uh, what they said were rubber bullets, but it was investigated and it turns out they are covered in rubber and they are metal inside. Uh, hundreds of people were blinded. A couple of people were completely blinded by the, by the injury from this. And what you can see now in this picture is the, it's the so-called first line, La Primera Linea, which is uh, all sorts of people uh, from many walks of life. You know, it tends to be stigmatized and, and to be criminalized, but it's actually young professionals, all kinds of people that have gathered together and, uh, and go and confront the police to protect really the, the peaceful protest, which is what you are seeing now. This is an iconic picture from uh, October the 25th, which is the the biggest march in the history of Chile so far. Um, uh, almost one and a half million people in the streets of Santiago and uh, over two million in the whole country. And uh, you can see there in the flag, uh, Chile despertó, which is the, 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 which was one of the, can you go back to the, to the one before, uh, please? Which is one of the very important uh, concepts here that Chile awoke and then you could see on the flag just under on what would be the red uh, part of our flag, yeah? It says, no estamos en guerra, hashtag no estamos en guerra, which is we are not at war, which is a direct uh, response to President Piñera, who, uh, who criminalized the movement. And in the first days, uh, in his first speech, he said, we are at war against uh, a dangerous uh, and powerful enemy. And uh, it turns out that there is no such enemy. The enemy is the 96% or 94% of the Chilean people who were manifesting against uh, the system and against his his um, uh, politics. No, so it's a very it's a very meaningful image. This one because it uh, com comprises many 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 things at once. When I was there in Chile at the end of last year, there was this amazing sense of the presence of the past, but in an entirely new context. And it felt it in the streets and the energy, but also in the music and the presence of music from the past and the presence of poetry and the poetry of graffiti as well. Mm -hmm. So with that, I want to invite you to uh, maybe do a first song for us. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to play a song that uh, is based on a Violeta Parra composition called La Mazurkica Modernica. It's uh, the modern mazurka. And uh, it's already when she wrote this song, she was playing to the tradition. And she was uh, writing in a style uh, which is very funny in a way, which is uh, transforming every word like gibberish, you know, uh, and uh, turning it into something that is a little bit trickier to, to understand. And uh, therefore, disguising and going around censorship. And a couple of years ago, uh, not directly in October last year, but a couple of years before, for the 100th anniversary of her birth, I wrote uh, these new lyrics uh, to the song thinking of uh, what would Violeta Parra say of this reality that we live in and of this Chile that has uh, become uh, such a un unjust and unfair place. Are you there, Tom? Because you froze for me. Yes, we're here, but go ahead. This is okay. your run. Ahí vamos. This is called La Mazurkica Postmodernica, the postmodern mazurka. <laughs> Preguntadico y en otras tierras, ¿qué tal la cósica aquí en Chilítico? Si los inglésicos de Sudamérica son los jaguáricos más exitosicos. La respuesta que le se da, digo, es la que yo cántico en esta mazurquica. Poco ha cambiado, digo, desde los tiempos en que digérica violeta párrica. Que el descontentico haya su causica en las promesicas jamás cumplidicas de los gobiernicos y parlamenticos, sean piñéricos o bacheleticos. Los estudiánticos siguen marchándico y los paquíticos les siguen dándico con sus guanáticos y sus lumíticas y con sus fuércicas tan especiálicas y mientras tánticos siguen creciendo todas las deúdicas de los muchachicos 
Algunos señóricos hacen negocios con los ahorricos acumuladicos. De todo el mundo que ha trabajado toda su vida por pocos pésicos. Ganan millónicos con inversiónicas y nada que dedica para los viejíticos. Y Dios no quería que algún anciánico caiga malítico con algún cólico. Los hospitalicos no dan avance para la gente que ya se enfermica. No les alcanza con sus pensiónicas para cisápricas que son privadicas. Amarraditicos por un papelico están los sueñicos del popularico. Constitucionica de la República, Jaime Guzmánico, Ricardo Láguicos. Cortan las sálicas de todo un pueblico y en la medídica de lo posiblico. Y mientras tanto los festivalicos le hacen tributicos a la violética. Unos y ópticos se ganan fóndicos y en todos lados se la celebrica. Si ella sugiérica como es la cósica, no se aforrarica el manso charchásico con su guitarrica y su charánguico. Se revolcarica en el cementerico. I hope you can hear that. Thunderous applause coming at you, Nano. <laughs> I can feel it. I can feel it. <laughs> I can, Omar, can you open the microphones or unmute people so that we can applaud wildly, please? I guess not. Oh, thank you so much. Beautiful. Um, and those of us who know Chile will hear the past and the and the, and the present. And there. listen, there's a, there's one thing that um, to take us back to those days, the las jornadas uh, de octubre y noviembre. Um, no son 30 pesos, son 30 años. Could you say a word about that? Of course, yeah. Um, what sparked this, uh, this uh, uprising, uh, as a couple of times before in the history of Chile, and that's very interesting and must be said, was a relatively small uh, rise in the price of public transport. No, 30 pesos is, what is it? It's like 40 cents of a dollar less. I don't know. It's 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 a uh, it's a marginal part of the price. Um, but uh, this was kind of uh, se dice en castellano lluvia sobre mojado, like uh, raining over the the wet. No, it was just the drop that uh, filled the glass. Uh, so so uh, internationally, the news media was saying over the rise of 30 pesos, uh, Chile has exploded. But the reality was a lot deeper than that. The normal complex. So very. Quickly on, it, co it, it, it caught up and everyone was saying, no son eh, 30 pesos, son 30 años. It's not about 30 pesos, it's about 30 years. Uh, and 30 years marking the time uh, frame from when the dictatorship of Pinochet uh, came to its end. Brackets came to its end, because that's exactly the point being. No, uh, Did it come to its end, actually, or was it just... Uh, soft transition in which uh, the system that they uh, came up with was actually uh, perpetrated no? by the Concertación, which is this uh, center-left coalition that came to rule and that was predominantly ruling for these last 30 years with one and now two intervals of, of Sebastián Piñera. Um, so really, it's a lot of uh, historical information in this one phrase. It's not 30 pesos, it's 30 years. Yeah, the... the there's a lot of ways in which we can see the continuity after the transition to democracy. And one of those which was most startling, and we could even see this from outside the country, was the ferocious repression that people, when they took to the streets, faced. And I mean, the images themselves of tanques blindados, of you know, armored vehicles and uh, high-powered rifles and people being systematically gassed and confronted at each time. Could you talk a little bit about the repression 
Mm. It was for us uh, in some ways uh, something shocking and new and in, in many ways not, no? something quite expected and something that we had been seeing uh, gradually over the last uh, decade since 2006 where the st student movement started uh, picking up and then very intensely in 2010 and especially 2011-12, uh, the repression was quite uh, extreme and you could see that those people both in political power and especially the people who who were now ruling uh, the military and the police forces were coming directly from the dictatorship and had that uh, education, so to speak, no, in how to deal uh, with the social uprising. And um, I was uh, quite uh, amazed, I would say, by by confronting the reality of Chile with other countries when when I was able to travel and to tour and to see how things are. For example, in Argentina, which is such a close country to us and it's in so in so many ways uh, similar but you have protests and you don't have this kind of repression also for us it's something that is completely naturalized and my generation we were born towards the end of the dictatorship so, so we never really knew anything else but even even uh, considering that what we saw this time around was very different and we saw uh, we saw the military come out to the street for the first time uh, in 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 decades uh, due to social and political reasons, and it was very shocking. It was uh, uh, surreal and a little bit hard to believe that there was tanks on the corner of our streets. No, that there was uh, barricades all over town, and that was uh, videos going around social media by the tens every day in the in the first months of the uprising of people being uh, killed. You know, and of dead people on the street, and things that you would say this this doesn't happen anymore. It's 2019. You know, uh, it's the 21st century we are supposed to be past this uh, brutality but clearly we are not no so it was uh, very moving also and i think it sparked in a way uh, even bigger uprising you know because the way that they reacted was possibly the worst possible way you know it was getting out the military on the first day i mean i can i can uh, illustrate with some decimas because i wrote a lot on those first days no so Please. so uh, the first night, no, I, I will never forget that day of the 18th of October, and you should go before a couple of days. Um, I remember clearly on the 16th of October, the Wednesday night, I, I was up to meet a friend downtown, and I took the bus from here, and uh, after a, a while, I just had to get down because the bus wasn't moving. I was sitting there for one hour and didn't move at all. I said, okay, I'm going to walk. And I remember walking down Alameda, the main street, already the price of the public transport had raised and the students were, um, this is important, it's not a detail, it's actually a key part of the story. The, the students were the ones who started protesting against the rise of the, of the transport price by evading the controls. You had this in New York uh, a couple of months later, I think in response a little bit, no? Um, so... Uh, the, the, the we, we call it hopping the turnstiles. Exactly, hopping. Here, evadir, no? Evadir, no pagar otra forma de luchar was an important slogan. Like, hoping is another way of fighting the system, no? Uh, so this uh, started happening, which was in turn uh, responded by taking the police into the subway system uh, and trying to stop this, which very quickly it brought about the collapse of the whole transport system and it had to close. And a couple of days, as I was saying, uh, before the 18th already, you could sense that something was very wrong and that something was going on that had not happened before. I remember calling up my friend and saying, hey man, I don't know what's going on, but I have this apocalyptic feeling in the streets of Santiago and I shall never forget it because indeed, no, two days later, it was it was very sudden, you know. Uh, it was uh, protest as usual in a way, and then a bit more and a bit more. And I had to attend a concert uh, downtown, so I it was almost impossible to get there. Uh, a friend of us picked us up. We were driving. We had to park a couple of blocks away from here and walk the rest of it. And already, as we approached downtown, you could see okay, the level of violence here is something else. It was finally it was exploding, you know. And uh, and for those who could understand the words of the song that I was singing before. If you put it in context, already years before people were saying, okay, this doesn't make sense, you know, this cannot go forward as it is. And the feeling for all of us, I think, was, was okay, it was a little bit of relief. Like, finally, this is, this is something is going on. No, this could not continue as it, uh, as it was before. Um, so, yeah, that first night of, of uh, October the 18th was, uh, was pretty much like uh, the beginning of a new chapter in history, and it was very clear. 
it was very explicit, you know, uh, there was no, no really uh, wandering around. Uh, it took us only a couple of days, I think, to, to, to put the word revolution into our mouths. You know, it was like, okay, there is no other name really for what is going on here. You know? There is no other way to, to call this. It's not anymore some protest, you know, it's not an isolated uh, situation. It quickly picked up a, a, across the whole country. And the first uh, thing that was very shocking was the fires on the subway system. You know, this was a catalyst. This was uh, something that was uh, um, very, uh, a very specific attack on the public transfer system, you know, and uh, still it remains to be uh, known who, who was it, you know, that, that fired up this. And it's, it's a very hard question to speculate around. It would be very responsible on my behalf to do it. But it must be said that uh, the, 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 the metro system, the subway system in Chile has, I'm going to make it up, I forgot, but something like 200 different security cameras in each station you know, and there was dozens of stations burnt and there is not a single video of anyone doing anything, you know, which is very suspicious and, and, and it stinks, you know, everywhere. So I don't want to speculate, especially not in public, but it is a very strange situation. And, and I started writing straight on that night. So I will read some decimals for you. And this was the first one that I wrote as I was sitting there on a bar uh, trying to understand what was going on. And so it says, Santiago se está quemando de tanta desigualdad de rabia, de indignidad, y Piñera está cenando. La ciudad está estallando, ya se cansó de su juego. El pueblo no estaba ciego, ni sordo, ni adormecido. Los fuegos se han encendido. Se han encendido los fuegos. Which translates, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, something like, Santiago is burning because of so much inequality, because of rage, because of indignity. And the president he said dinner. This is a very specific reference to a, a, a disconcerting fact that uh, there was a leak of a picture of Piñera having dinner at a fancy pizza place with his family at the very same time when the country was exploding and he left the government palace uh, already when it was happening. No, no one could understand. And so it goes further. The city is blowing up. Everyone is fed up of his game. The people were not blind, not deaf, not asleep the fires have turned on, the fires have turned on. And then I remember clearly it was half an hour after that, I was seeing the writing and posting it on, on social media, that he came on television and he announced the national state of emergency. And he said, as of now, the military is in charge of uh, the city. And this was a huge shock. This was like the worst nightmares possible coming alive, you know, in, 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 in one night. So, so you've been writing dozens of decimas. You've, you've published an entire book of decimas. Mm. Say a word about the decima. Yeah, the decima is a particular structure of uh, poetry that uh, emerged in the, in the, what is called El Siglo de Oro, the golden century of Spanish poetry uh, in the 16th century, the, the, in the transition from the Renaissance to the Baroque, which was a very fertile time for arts in general and culture in Spain, because Spain was the main power at the world at the time. And it consists, uh, you can see here, of, uh, I don't know if you can see it, of 10 verses. Uh, each verse is octosyllable, which means that there's eight metrical syllables in each. Uh, and it has a particular rhyming scheme, which is scheme, which I'm, I'm not going to get into detail now. But if you listen to it, it's very musical. No? Many, 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 many songs are written in decimas. And this tradition of, of writing chronicle in decimas is not something that I came up with. It's something that has centuries uh, of tradition. And uh, not only in Chile, but in all of Latin America and also in Spain. Where funny enough, it didn't survive so much. Uh, it stayed as something more of, of, the, of the period. Whereas in Latin America, it, uh, it came with them on the ships and it really took up, took on, and it became the, uh, the, the um, how do you say, the most uh, archetypical uh, form of popular poetry. And this is also improvised, no? Uh, it is very interesting. It's a very deep tradition and it, there's a lot that we could uh, say about that. I was following you on Facebook and other people can. And... This was, as Marcial said, one of my main news sources for what was actually going on in Chile because you were producing one every day or every two days. And this is one of the things that I found fascinating is um, immediate reaction to an expression of what people was living was on the walls, was in the poetry and in the song. In other words, culture was being produced immediately and, and as part of the mobilization. 
not only in your poetry, but also in your songs. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if we could maybe hear one of the songs that you wrote. Uh, Absolutely. Um, so as, as I was uh, mentioning before, when we were looking at the pictures that you selected, a uh, lot, uh, lot of protesters got uh, eye injuries and this became a strong symbol, no? the eyes. Uh, it's a kind of um, unfortunate uh, poetical coincidence no? that uh, at the same time as people were saying Chile despertó, Chile awoke, uh, the protesters were being blinded, no? And there was one particular case which was very moving and very emblematic, which was the case of Gustavo Gatica, who's a young 21-year-old uh, uh, history student who was unfortunately the first of a couple of, of, of cases later that was uh, hurt in both eyes at the same time. He got shot by the police in his eyes and he became instantly blinded for life. And it was very moving and he, he, he made a, his mother did an interview a couple of days later, two or three days after that, in which she said that uh, Gustavo had told her that uh, regalé mis ojos para que la gente despierte, which means I've given away my eyes so that everyone can wake up. Uh, and I found that to be very, very, very moving. Uh, uh, I was in tears when I read it and, and immediately a song came out and, uh, and it was one of those songs that just uh, come at the time where they have to come. And it, 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 it was uh, spread very quickly and, uh, and eventually it got to him, we got to meet, you know, so there has been a whole relationship around this song. Um, so let me sing it for you. It's called Regale Mis Ojos. <laughs> de los pueblos y su identidad cantó desde el fuego de la lucha por la dignidad cantó con la sangre de los ojos que nos sanarán cantó para denunciar que el nunca más no era verdad cantó por los muertos que se fueron y no volverán Canto sin sosiego porque nada los devolverá. Canto por Gustavo y por los días que ya no verá. Entre tanta noche y entre tanta muerte, regale mis ojos para que la gente despierte. Tanta noche, de tanta muerte, regale mis ojos para que la gente despierte. Canto como un río de esperanza por lo que vendrá. Canto porque el miedo tenemos se nos pasará canto sin sosiego porque nada no te volverá canto para que el canto sea un arma de la libertad canto por los niños que son libres de toda maldad canto por los viejos que merecen otra realidad canto con pena y me da rabia la desigualdad canto porque el verso es mi fusil en esta sociedad y entre tanta noche y entre tanta muerte regale mis ojos para que la gente despierte entre tanta noche Tanta muerte, regale mis ojos para que la gente despierte. De tanta noche, de tanta muerte, regale mis ojos para que la gente despierte. Tanta noche, entre tanta muerte, regale mis ojos 
para que la gente me despierte. Thank you, Nana. Beautiful. Thank you. I remember I went to see you perform in Santiago and it was hard to catch up with you because you were running hard from one activity to another, to another, to another. I finally did find you in a neighborhood um, where people were holding open debates about different aspects of what was going on, different political opportunities. <laughs> I remember they set up a stage for you. The sound system failed. So I remember you ripped the cables out of it. You said, okay, everybody, move in, move in, move in. And everybody picked up their chairs and crushed in and you sang that song and what amazed me is the song maybe was only three weeks old but everybody knew the words and I don't think there was a dry eye in the crowd it was a it was a very very moving moment but one of the things we also heard in in those meetings a lot of conversation about what do we do and the, and the thing that was on a lot of people's lips was the constituyente the idea of reconstituting the country we got a question a second ago in the chat box about the constituyente. Maybe you could say about a, a word about what is that demand and and where does it stand today? Yeah. Um, so the, the mother of all political battles in Chile at this time was the opportunity to change the constitution because the constitution uh, that we have now uh, was written uh, during the dictatorship of Pinochet. It was a uh, completely illegitimate uh, democratical uh, char charade. No, They tried to, to, to legitimate it through a fake referendum that was done without any voting registers with military holding their guns, you know, in the middle of, of the, right in the middle of the dictatorship. And it was a constitution that was um, put in place with the sole uh, purpose of, uh, uh, what's the word in English? Um, per perpetuating, perpetuating, perpetuating. Yeah, uh, the, the, the neoliberal system that was uh, put in place in Chile by the Chicago boys, the, the, the guys, the economists that went to study in the Chicago School of Economics with Friedman and came here. And uh, this is not something that I'm making up uh, because of my political views. This is something that uh, is there on tape in video. Uh, there's interviews, uh, not even interviews, there's a conference that Jaime Guzman, the main ideologist of this constitution and, and one of the main political minds of the, of the dictatorship, he says openly uh, after the end of, uh, of uh, after the return to the so-called democracy, he says, we have put uh, together a constitution that uh, makes sure that even when our adversaries are in power, they don't have the power to change what really matters. No, in 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 a in a clear metaphor, and this is what uh, people are are now more aware of here in Chile is that the field is is. Uh, no, it's inclined. Uh, there is no fair play. Uh, it's not uh, a constitution that uh, allows for political processes to reflect the demands of the people. It is a constitution that neutralizes uh, the political um, presence uh, of the people and the democratic uh, ways that should be in place. And also, uh, and very importantly, it is a uh, constitution that completely uh, restricts the state of the role of the state uh, into a subsidiary state that is not allowed to participate in any activity where there is a private um, en uh, enterprise going on, which in reality uh, translates into the fact that everything in Chile is privatized, education is privatized, health is privatized, to the ridiculous point that water is privatized. No, uh, now it all comes together, and it is uh, it is uh, it, it is almost uh, hard to believe that the government is saying because of the sanitary health crisis you must wash your hands, but because of the constitution there is places where there is no water. You know, to even to wash your hands, water to drink, water to cook, and then you travel ten kilometers and there's all these trees for export uh, of of fruits. You know, and foods that are privately owned, which are drying all the water, and this is all. Um, written in the constitution, and I'm trying to, to explain this in, in a few words, but it is the same constitution that holds uh, many layers of locks that makes it impossible to change the constitution from within. Now, through the decades, there has been attempts to erode through these locks, but ultimately it is, uh, it is almost impossible, no? So it, um, there was a lot of, of very smart uh, people that, that, that uh, 
have uh, dedicated their lives to the study of, of the Chilean constitution and of the political process around it. I would uh, like to mention particularly Professor Fernando Atria, who's a law professor at the uh, Universidad de Chile. And uh, he wrote this book many years ago, no? he, uh, it, which is called um, La Constitución Tramposa, the cheating constitution, no? in which he says, uh, given the fact that the Chilean constitution is blocking uh, the political processes from responding to the demands of the people, if there is uh, no attention paid to this point and, and if there is no change from within, the situation will reach a point where it is going to blow up. And this is exactly what happened October last year, and it just it didn't hold. So uh, that's why I mean uh, when I said before that the constitutional debate is the mother of all the battles uh, in, in Chilean politics. And the, um, the pressure accumulated for the first month of the revolt to a point where by mid-November, uh, the risk of a military uh, coup was very real. It was absolutely real. And um, it, is, it is difficult for me for, to explain this in, in, in a short uh, time, but uh, there is also the, the back, el antecedente, como se dice? The antecedents. The, the, yeah, uh, the, 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 the context here is that Piñera, the president, who is a right-wing president, also has tensions with the more extreme right and has tensions with the military because the military um, feel that they have been mistreated by, by Piñera and his uh, government and his previous government. So they were not completely supporting him. No, they, they, There was this clash of tensions between the military and the right-wing government uh, in terms of the military saying, if we go out, we go out properly, no? We go out and we, we are in charge. We are not going to be obeying, no? So there was all this very, 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 very critical week uh, in the middle of November that brought about this uh, so-called uh, acuerdo, uh, this big agreement, you know, of all the, uh, of most of the political parties and forces in, in Congress in Chile, uh, in which they announced that there would be a referendum uh, to decide whether or not Chile wants a new constitution, no? And uh, this was received with a lot of skepticism because we have a memory uh, from already from the transition, the end of the dictatorship, which was in the end pretty much a uh, hoax, you know, and a lot of makeup, but the same, pre the same, uh, the same uh, structure. Uh, but there was a lot of hope also. And uh, that referendum was meant to take place on Sunday, the 26th of April of this year, the fact that I know that it was Sunday, the 26th of April, illustrates a little bit for everyone what a big deal it was, no? It was really, in a way, the, the escape valve for all of this pressure. Um, but the protests didn't end. Uh, the protests were very intense up until March. And that is why this whole coronavirus in Chile has been a particularly uh, part of my French, but it's been a fucked up uh, situation, no? Uh, already, it is uh, incredibly hard to deal with such a pandemic. But if you put on top of it the fact that uh, the government are clearly using this as an excuse to uh, throw dirt, you know, on top of the mess that, that, that they that they create in a way or that they didn't uh, fix, you know, it is uh, doubly frustrating. So I want to uh, get some more music in here for a second. One thing that we saw was um, a lot of collaborations, um, redoing old songs in a new way, um, crowdsourced with musicians from all over Chile. Uh, many, uh, somebody put in the chat box a moment ago, El Derecho de Vivir en Paz, uh, The mm -hmm. Right to Live in Peace by Victor Jara. Uh, but we also saw those images of maybe 2,000 people in front of, I think it was the National Library, playing yeah. that song out on the street. I was wondering, could you, would, could you take us back to one of um, that body of work? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, Victor Jara was, uh, was uh, is, you know, uh, the emblem of a political song in Chile, and he sparked so so many other fires, no, including Inti Gimani and Kilapayun, which were very closely connected to him. 
and uh, his song survived, but it was very moving what happened uh, during those, uh, those uh, the, the last six months in Chile, it's still happening, because his voice and that of Violeta Parra uh, became alive, you know, and they became alive not only on the radio or in the media, but they became alive in people's homes, in all the neighborhoods. You, you were there with me, going around and seeing that everyone had their guitars out and everyone was singing. Uh, there's this emblematic image of 2,000 people singing in front of the National uh, Library. Um, but, uh, but it was not only on the big flashy occasions, you know, it was everywhere. You could hear it uh, during the curfew, the first curfew, you know, <laughs> uh, on balconies and everyone singing to each other. Um, so it, 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 it uh, helped us also to connect to our history, you know, and to understand that the struggle that we are going through now and that we are uh, giving, you know, the fight that we are giving is the same, it's exactly the same and it is against the same adversary and it is in pretty much the same context, you know, there is a direct historical connection which is not something of the remote past, you know uh, I personally I'm, I'm very lucky and privileged to be able to, to collaborate uh, on a very daily basis with people like uh, Iyapu or Inti Gimani who, who in terms, in their own terms, when they were young, they were collaborating with Victor Jara, you know, uh, so it is a, it's one step away uh, in terms of history and, and it's very exciting. So yeah, I'm going to sing for you a little bit of Victor Jara, of course, absolutely. Um, I'm going to sing uh, not El Derecho de Vivir en Paz, which you can listen to. It's, it's there everywhere. It's also in Spotify. You can hear a new version that we recorded, a collective of like 50 Chilean artists. Uh, that recording was very, uh, I don't know what the best adjective would be, but definitely it was a very uh, out of the ordinary recording because it took place in the middle of the curfew. So we were coming in and out of the studio with the military on the street and recording this song. It was a very intense moment. But I will sing for you one of his most tender songs uh, because I think also music has this power of, of bringing some, some uh, little bit of, uh, of uh, warmth uh, in these times where we most certainly need it. So I'm going to sing El Cigarrito, a very, very, very tender and beautiful song, one of the first ones that Victor wrote. Here goes. Ay, 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 me 
Yeah, I hear. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I hear it too. This is beautiful. Thank you. So, I just want to encourage people to keep putting uh, questions into the chat box because we will have time afterwards to take a couple more. So, what? Where are we now, uh, Nano? One of the things that terrified me, terrified, that worried me terribly, was that with the quarantines, with the pandemic, somehow all of this beautiful energy would be doused. Um, how do you feel it today? What, what's, yeah. Well, first of all, you know, uh, I can only speak for myself and, uh, and it's very hard to, to see the, the upcoming future, no? to see what's going to happen. But in terms of the energy, indeed, uh, there has been, uh, a reclusion, no? Uh, we're all shit scared first because the virus is out of control. It's uh, going up pretty much by like a thousand more new cases every, a thousand increase from the day before, no? Up to almost 4,000 new cases every day now. 85% per of, of those in Santiago. Uh, so it's a very somber situation from the health point of view. And of course, this... Uh, means that we have to be responsible and that we have to respect the quarantines but also it brings about the very painful truth that in order to respect the to be able to respect the quarantines you have to have a economic situation that allows you to do so most of people that live in the outer neighborhoods of santiago cannot afford to to stop working because they live out of informal income that is on a day-to-day -day basis. So basically people don't work for a day and they don't get food for that day. It's that bad, no? And the government has uh, put in place uh, some aid plans which are really uh, offensive. I mean, they, the, 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 the total amount of money that they offer for people who are in this situation is below the line of not only poverty, of homelessness. And, and according to their very own uh, statistics, no? Uh, and there was a very heated uh, political debate in Congress and around it uh, over the past weeks when they were trying to approve this. And basically the, the disgusting argument on the government side was saying that uh, the opposition was blocking all aid because they were not conforming with the amounts, no? But it turns out that all of those people who said two weeks ago or one week ago even, listen, uh, government, you cannot give that amount of money because people are going to starve. And what do you think is going to happen when people have no food? Well, it turns out, of course, that they were right. And this is what we're starting to experience this week. And, and to tell you the truth, it's a very, 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 very heartbreaking, uh, harsh reality. I speak from my privilege, and I want to make this super clear, from the situation of a, of a well-off musician who's able to travel and tour and sing about these realities. But it is also very com confronting that in a time like this, I can, in the end, allow myself to be home and to stay here and to take care of myself and to take care of those around me and my neighbors and my family. But I can only accept the fact that this is going on. And there's uh, little that, that, that we can do on the direct action level, especially if you contrast with, with that reality that we were living only two months ago, which was, as you experience yourself, effusive and epic and explosive and communal and collective in every possible way. So I just, uh, per this is again, completely just my opinion, no? but, but I hope that quickly we can get past uh, the peak of the health crisis so that we can get back to business in a way, uh, in the very important business of moving forward the, 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 the process of, uh, of the constitutional reform and, and which includes 
changes at so many levels. But I'm afraid, and this has become very clear, that um, the powers that be are, of course, using this pandemic uh, uh, as a tool of suppressing uh, in every way possible the uprising. Uh, they have set now a new date for the referendum in, uh, in October, uh, just to give you an illustration of how ridiculous uh, the arguments are on the government's behalf, on the same week that they said that uh, it may be uh, it, it should be considered that the referendum could also not go on in October because of sanitary reasons. On the same week, they announced that they were planning of opening the shopping centers. So you say, okay, wait, something here doesn't uh, fit. No, this is, uh, this is the feeling. And in terms of cultural activities, we have a question here. Um, are there new rules of social distancing that would allow you to have public activities as an artist? Or are you completely shut down at the moment we're completely shut down uh, all gatherings are banned at the moment there is uh, five million people there is uh, uh, almost half of the population under strict quarantine you cannot go out of your house unless you get and, permission from the military and if you do you and could get arrested if you do you, you you can and people are getting arrested and fined uh, and there is absolutely no space for artistical gatherings or cultural gatherings or even much less political gatherings. Uh, so, so we don't know, you know, uh, because my livelihood depends on this. Of course, I am every day trying to suss the situation and see, but no one knows. And I, it would be very arrogant from, from, from me to start saying what's going to happen. Pff, no one knows. No. Yeah. Yeah. This is why, uh, and I give some inside information for, for those, uh, 80 people who are now joining us that the name is uprising and uncertainty no because really now the situation is uh, is very uncertain and uh, i'm sure all of you guys listening from around the world who are living through this pandemic you can relate to the feeling of this being like a cat catastrophe in slow motion no in chile we say an earthquake in slow motion because we we have earthquakes uh, quite often but but it, also in chile it's the fact that we've had two completely life-altering uh, crises in less than six months, no? And this is very intense. It's like, it's a very interesting time uh, to live through. And uh, someone told me a couple of days ago uh, that there's an old Chinese uh, proverb saying, I hope that you don't live through interesting times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, I don't mean to be, I don't want to in, in any way suggest not that we don't feel how much has been lost and what is being lost every day. And at the same time, these crises are wake up moments where we are delivered lessons and signals that in a certain way we are thankful for. And I'm wondering what, what, what are you discovering? Oh, so many things, no? Uh, there's a whole lu luminous side uh, to, this, uh, to this situation, especially for someone like me, who, who is a complete workaholic and anxious personality. And I've been uh, living as a professional musician since I'm 15 years old and traveling since I'm 18, nonstop. So it's actually the first time in my life, since I live in my house and not in my parents' house, that I've been for such a long time at home it's really literally the longest i've ever been and these have been wonderful i mean i've been able to 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 you know dedicate myself to other things you know uh to to deepening uh in learning in reading in the joy of just being home of intimacy of, of me and my partner uh, stupid little things but like your the, your pets you know and things like that but which are really so important and and also realizing that all of this busyness is completely unnecessary, you know? that you can be perfectly happy with very little things, not buying anything at all. You know, uh, um, we were talking that they like pretty much no one has bought anything for the last two or three months and who needs anything? You know, if, if, if there's anything we do need is each other and the fact that we cannot meet and hug and be, but everything else is irrelevant. There's this, this beautiful uh, thought going around, uh, and realization that the economy is in crisis, is in the deepest crisis that we've known, pretty much because of the fact that everyone is just buying what they need and nothing else, you know? And that is beautiful. And that I think is a, is a great lesson uh, to see our cities without pollution, to be able in Santiago to look around and see the, the, the mountains 360, which we, we, we are brought up hearing that we are a city surrounded by mountains, but in actual reality, you can never see it, you know, it's all gray. Uh, so finally, these kind of things, I, I hope, 
that will uh, takes a, it takes us a step closer into into realizing uh, and to learning very important lessons. But then, if you if you ask me, I I'm a little bit pessimistic in an optimistic big time frame. You know uh, that I still, as I did before, I think that we are humans experiencing uh, a process of crisis that will. Uh, lead us to a collapse at some point. This could be 200, 300, 120 years, who knows? Uh, and, and perhaps this will accelerate all of these processes and, uh, and things tend to, to fade, to cross fade, to put it in production terms, in musical production terms. No? And slowly, slowly new ways of life are emerging. And I think we are all part of that as well. No? We are all learning lessons every day and, and surely this earthquakes, you know, uh, they, are, they, are, they are catalyst and they accelerate. And, and to, to, to use and abuse the earthquake metaphor one last time. When there is an earthquake, everything that is not completely robust and true and rooted in reality just falls off. And those things who remain, you realize are the, the things that you can really hold on to in times of, of intense crisis. And that's what we should uh, now consider. Yeah, I remember um, you made an offhand comment to me when we were in Santiago. Um, in the midst of all of that effervescence. And I think you said, Toda esa mierda había sido por algo. all that shit that we were doing, you know, we had no idea what was going to come to pass yeah. one year, three years, six months ago. And, yeah. and here it is. Yeah. And I, I, I carry that with me still because, you know, we're figuring out new ways to connect. We got these platforms and things like that. But I also want to believe that these sorts of connections, um, they take us somewhere. Yeah, absolutely Listen, they do. Can we get another song? Yes, yes, by all means. Um, this one is dedicated to the infamous president of our country. And uh, by, by extension, I could also dedicate to the president of your country. La gente tiene rabia que en la calle se siente Ojo por ojo, diente por diente Las balas se devuelven, señor presidente Hay mucha rabia en la calle, en la calle hay mucha gente Y es la gente la que dice que se vaya el presidente Maldita sea la hora en que declaró la guerra Un negociante mezquino a la gente de su tierra Arde Troya y como no Es que muchos tienen nada y los que tienen Todos tienen a la fuerza armada Cuán ciego se debe ser para no ver que está despierto Un pueblo que va a la lucha muerto a muerto, muerto a muerto Ojo por ojo Diente por diente, la gente tiene rabia que en la calle se siente. Ojo por ojo, diente por diente, las balas se devuelven, señor presidente. Ojo por ojo, diente por diente, la gente tiene rabia que en la calle se siente. Ojo por ojo, diente por diente, las balas se devuelven, señor presidente. El país en que vivimos carga signos de opresión, y aunque somos solo un pueblo, somos más de una nación. Ya basta de asesinarnos, de reprimirnos con balas, no queremos más ricos balazos en las salas, más de un millón de personas dijimos. En la Alameda Ya no le tenemos miedo Al pato ni al toque queda El arma de nuestro canto Va cargada de esperanza Y con eso que se sepa No se juega, no se tranza Ojo por ojo Diente por diente La gente tiene rabia Que en la calle se siente Ojo por ojo Diente por diente Las balas se devuelven, señor presidente. Ojo por ojo, diente por diente. La gente tiene rabia que en la calle se siente. Ojo por ojo, diente por diente. Las balas se devuelven, señor presidente.
<sighs> we got a lot of comments out here from different countries saying, yeah, my president too. <laughs> yeah. All around. All around. All around. Fantastic, mm -hmm. Nano. Thank you very much. I got one more question here from mm -hmm. the from folks. Um, we're going on the hour now, which is basically what we had laid out. And I really appreciate you taking the time and for everybody joining us. Um, and the question is, is what can we do to help? And I think the we here is those of us who are outside Chile. And um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I think uh, first of all is to visibilize this reality and to make it visible. And uh, what you guys are doing is already of great help. Uh, and I don't mean specifically with this event, which I, I am very grateful for, but in general, no. Um, and I think this is really a, a crisis that is transversal, no, that is not local here to Chile. Even though we live it in our own specific way, uh, you guys have enough to worry about yourselves back there at home and everyone in their own countries. I think, as I said before, we are experiencing a crisis which is pandemic no we are experiencing the 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 the, the uh, point in which uh, this system doesn't hold up anymore no uh, so i would say that uh, that uh, the easiest uh, or the most real way to help us is that if is that this starts happening all over no because uh, we live in in a world that is so interconnected that uh, it's uh, not enough for one people to to stand up no we have to have a international perspective and we have to have a collective perspective in in that uh, in that sense yeah, thank you for that. I, I have the feeling here in the United States that the death is, some would like us to normalize the losses so that we become immune to them. And we're going to have to struggle against that both internally, as we discover that those who are dying here are the poor, the people of color. Mm -hmm. And also as the epicenters move to the global south, it's going to mm -hmm. be imperative for us to not lose focus, to stay mm -hmm. attentive. I have a couple of other really interesting questions. We can do a quick, short Q&A here. Sure. Someone asks, um, eyes are a recurring theme in your art, in your music. Could you they say are, more about that? And, and they are especially now. No? Uh, these yeah. two songs, Regale Mis Ojos and Ojo Por Ojo, they are like uh, uh, two sides of the same coin. They are the rage and the, and, and the compassion, I think, of what we're living here. And as I said, the eye has become the symbol uh, really of, of the revolt here because uh, on the first uh, hand there was the Chile despertó, Chile woke up, it opened its eyes, but then they came and shot us right in the eyes no? and blinded us. Uh, and, uh, and for each person that, that lost an eye, it was a little bit like we were all losing a little bit of, of vision. And, in, and, and on the other side, there's again these such powerful words from Gustavo saying, I gave my eyes so that all of you can wake up. No? And I had the the terrible uh, experience of being there in, in, in downtown Santiago and seeing people carried by, in stretchers by the volunteers bleeding on their eyes, you know, and, and knowing that, okay, this person has become blinded, you no? Know? And once you see it and you see it up front, it, uh, it confronts you with the reality that the powers that be are willing to kill in order to, to, to protect their privilege. You know? uh, and in some ways, um, whatever you believe about the origins of coronavirus or not, whatever, but it cannot be denied, as you said before, that the virus uh, does discriminate in many ways because yes. the people who get it worse are the poor, the color, the immigrants. You know? uh, so, so in that way, again, we cannot allow this for, to, to be an excuse for the same people to abuse the same, uh, the same people once again. You know? Thank you. Um, so uh, we had another question in here uh, about what will it take for the behavior of the police to change? I don't know how to answer this question. I think there's a lot of talk in Chile about a, a, a refounding of the of the police force, no? that it should that it should uh, disappear as we know it and there should be a new structure put in place. But this, of course, is easier said than done, no? Uh, yeah. There is experience in other countries as in Spain, for example, no? When, they, when, 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 when the dictatorship ended and then there was a reformation of the whole system and the new constitution could be a platform that would bring about these changes. But still the problem is it's deeper than that because it's not about structure. It's not about command chain. It's a, it's a problem of culture, 
no, of education, I think. It's a, it's a problem of lack of opportunity. I mean, at, at, at a certain point also, you feel empathy for, for the policemen, for the guys who are there doing this, this dirty work, no? I had the opportunity during uh, the, the roughest times in October when the military was still out on the street to approach uh, 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 Pelotoon, I don't know what the, the word in English is, uh, a group of, of military that were there in the street. And I approached the commander who was a young guy, probably he was my age, you know, and, and I started talking to him and I felt so bad, you know, because I was expecting the guy to be a son of a bitch, you know, to be this pig. And he was actually just some young dude who happened to be there and because of poverty and because of background and because of circumstance ended up in this situation of of being there with the machine gun and and it's terrible you know you hear stories from from past generations in the 70s where for example very notorious story here that in the Estadio Nacional which is just five minutes away from my home which was the biggest concentration camp in the after the coup in 1973 um, there was this situation in which there was a prisoner and uh, a young 20 year old prisoner and his brother was the military in charge of you no know, and the brother had to actually sh uh, kill him and he had to do it because if he didn't do it they would both be killed you no know? all of this the mother standing outside the state you know situations like this where you say the problem is not necessarily um particular to the institution but it is a disease that that in, involves the whole of the culture and again i think uh going back a couple uh, 10 years you know to the student revolts um education 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 is at the center of all of this inequality you no know? yeah. it is uh going back to the greeks and you 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 and probably most of the people watching could elaborate much more than me but uh socrates you know already and aristotle and they were so clear that there is no democracy without without access to education. No? One last question. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned a couple before, but this is a nice way to round out tonight is, what have been some of your uh, inspirations, the musicians who combined art and justice that have inspired you, mm -hmm. wherever they're from? Well, from Chile, of course, uh, Victor Jara and Violeta Parra are figures that are uh, impossible to elude no they are at the very center at the heart of what we do here uh and worldwide oh so many but i would i would uh, I, I would elaborate a little bit on on joan bias because i've had the luck to 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 share with her to play with her to spend time with her and uh and she said to me something that i will never forget she said to me integrity uh, is something that you cannot buy you can only sell it and no matter the price, it is not enough. Thank you very much, Nano. So I think we've come to the end of this program. Um, uh, maybe we'll ask you for one more song, but before we do go out, I wanna thank Clax, the Center for Latin American Caribbean Studies uh, at NYU, who made this possible. Um, I want to thank the North American Congress on Latin America who are co-sponsoring this event and also the Hemispheric Institute at NYU. Marcial, glad to see you back online. Would you like to say a word or two as we go out? We You're muted, see you. Marcial. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much uh, for your songs and for being with us today. And thank you to all the participants uh, that uh, have been with us and to Clax, of course, for putting this on. Muchas gracias a todos. Bueno, gracias a ti, Marcial. And thank you, Tom. Thank you, Omar, and the whole team. It's been a great pleasure to talk to all of you guys. And uh, I, I'm going to say goodbye with the song um, that is written based on a sonnet by one of the greatest Chilean poets who's still alive, uh, Mr. Oscar Han. The sonnet is called El Doliente, and it says, Pasarán estos días como pasan todos los días malos de la vida, which means uh, these days shall also pass just like all of the bad days in our life. Muchas gracias y hasta la próxima. Pasarán estos días como pasan Todos los días malos de la vida Amainarán los vientos que te arrasan se estancará la sangre de tu herida.
vela. El alma rante volverá a su nido. Lo que ayer se perdió será encontrado. El sol será sin mancha concebido y saldrá nuevamente en tu costado. Irás frente al mar como he podido, anhelado sin brújula y perdido como he podido. Llegar a puerto con las velas rotas. Una voz te dirá que no lo sabes. Una voz te dirá que no lo sabes. El mismo viento que rompió tus naves es el que hace volar a las gaviotas. Pasarán estos días como pasa todos los días malos de la vida amainarán los vientos que te arrasan se estancará la sangre de tu herida el alma grande volverá a su nido lo que ayer se perdió será encontrado el sol será sin mancha concebido y saldrá nuevamente en tu costado y dirás frente al mar como he podido anhelado sin brújula y perdido como he podido llegar a puerto con las velas rotas una voz te dirá que no lo sabes una voz te dirá que no lo sabes el mismo viento que rompió tus naves es el que hace volar a las gaviotas. Pasarán estos días como pasan todos los días malos de la vida. Pasarán estos días como pasan todos los días malos de la vida. Pasarán estos días como pasan todos los días malos de la vida. Pasarán estos días como pasan. Todos los días malos de la vida. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Vamos.